the use of manual osteoperforations and high frequency vibration in orthodontics. There will be time for some questions and answers at the conclusion. You'll be able to type them in and I will be able to read them uh, off to you. Um, regarding uh, some business in, up front here, by way of disclosure, uh, I am not employed by any specific dental company and uh, I do not own stock or, or interest and neither do my family members. Uh, I do get paid to consult for both Propel and Align Technologies, uh, and I am being compensated for my time here today. So uh, with all that being said, uh, let's continue. So I'll skip over my background uh, and uh, just dive right into it. So I truly believe that augmenting the patient's biology preceding force application is what I have coined the term the fourth order of orthodontics. We as orthodontists are so mired in the muck of first, second, and third order bracket slot design, you know, uh, torque in the base, torque in the face, active ligation, passive self-ligation, all that nonsense. And when you pan out uh, and really take a more panoramic view, uh, our ability now is that instead of applying a force and the host tissues re, uh, reacting after the fact, now we are able to augment the host tissue reaction preceding uh, force application. And again, this is the, the fourth order of orthodontics. So when it comes to accelerated orthodontics, certainly the obvious benefits are you know, less, visits, uh, less visits to complete the case, less time off of work or school, and as a result, patients are much less burned out. Obviously, with shorter treatment times, there are less hygiene issues. Uh, when it comes to a, a term, uh, I coined this term the orthodontic void, the vortex, this, this whole concept. And in the Northeast here, we had over the last several winters, not this past one, but previous winters, plunging temperatures uh, well below freezing for you know weeks at a time. And it was called the polar vortex with these plunging temperatures. So I call this the orthodontic vortex, this plunging number of office visits to complete a case while inversely increasing the profitability per case. And so when you think about this and you write out the, the algebraic orthodontic equation, if you will, the reduced visits per case uh, plus the increased profitability per visit, and for me, uh, without any braces uh, and pairing this technology with aligner therapy, it is a marketing strategy unlike anything else previously in our industry, and I am really fortunate uh, in, in central New Jersey to be known as the person to, to go to. And so you're here today to understand this technology, to embrace this technology, to truly make your practice stand out in your area. Because in 10 years from now, 15 years from now, moving teeth with braces without braces is going to be standard. Moving teeth in half the time is going to be standard. So as with many things and many technologies, it's those that are first to market that reap the benefits. So when it comes to different approaches and doctor controlled um, uh, methodologies of accelerating uh, tooth movement, you've got you know surgical approaches with uh, full thickness flaps and corticotomies. You've got piezo surgery uh, with or without a flap, and these are you know very invasive to moderately invasive. Uh, there's a lot of cost that goes into this. There's a lot of cost of of armamentarium for the doctor to to tool up uh, for a piezo surgery. There's recovery time with the uh, full thickness flaps and corticotomies. There's patient acceptance issues. There's pain. There's swelling. There's recovery. And then there's manual osteoperforations. Uh, and I happen to use the Propel drivers to do this. And they are micro-invasive. Uh, it's, it's relatively inexpensive. Minimal training. Uh, no downtime. Easily accepted by the patient. And it has been simply a wonderful, impactful technology that I've incorporated into my practice. And with manual osteoperforations, you're basically inducing the normal uh, response, the normal biology from uh, tooth movement in that when we move teeth, it is indeed controlled trauma. And with trauma, there is inflammation and minor injury. And you get basically you're stimulating with these manual osteoperforations, these cytokines uh, production. And um, as a result, you get an increase in remodeling as the bone temporarily becomes slightly less dense. And so we, I know I'm speaking to the choir here. We all understand 
pressure and tension when it comes to orthodontic tooth movement. And with a light amount of pressure, you get frontal resorption where the osteoclasts are recruited from the periodontal lig ligament space, as opposed to heavy forces where they're recruited from the medullary space. Um, and you get you know frontal resorption, you get uh, macrophages, eating bone on one side, osteoblasts on the other side, adding bone, and uh, the net result is tooth movement. If you have heavy forces, however, you get this undermining resorption, you get hyalinization regions, a cell-free zone, it's a much um, uh, more discomforting tooth movement, it's a much uh, longer uh, recovery from this type of tooth movement and force application, and it's certainly something that we do not aspire to. But nonetheless, we, there's this whole cascade of events that's occurring uh, with osteoclasts and uh, osteoblasts uh, and, and differentiation uh, from one to the other. And what is it about this whole cascade of events that we can stimulate and use to our and our patients' advantage, truthfully? And so the key study, the landmark study, was done uh, out of NYU, and it was published in the AJODO in uh, November of 2011. Um, and it, sh it showed uh, a, a very positive impact in the velocity of canine retraction when using um, manual osteoperforations. And so uh, there's, and I, and I you know, would tell you to please go through and look at that study, but it was a split mouth design, class two division one patients uh, requiring first bicuspid extraction. They're randomly designed uh, or to have, assigned I should say, to have uh, the control on one side and the experimental on the other. They both had TADs, they had calibrated springs to retract the cuspids, and on the control on the experimental side, uh, they did uh, osteoperforations. And so uh, what you see in figure A here is immediately following the procedure, figure B 24 hours later, and figure C four weeks later, 28 days later, and you can visually see the increased amount of tooth movement uh, on the side where uh, manual osteoperforations were completed. Then uh, from the visual, they went to measuring the cytokine expression. Uh, and indeed, uh, when they looked at the gingival curricular fluid, they showed a nice increase in all these secondary messengers, these interleukins 1 through 12, and all these things you have forgotten about since residency. Uh, but these are the secondary messengers, these, these uh, cytokine expressions, these inflammatory markers that are indicative of the inflammatory process that is occurring undergoing orthodontic tooth movement. And on the experimental side where osteoperforations were performed, there was a marked increase and a sustained increase of these inflammatory marker expressions. Um, and what they found is that uh, these elevated uh, levels uh, maintain themselves uh, for a good uh, three to four months following um, the, uh, the procedure. Uh, more so, they even shown and realized that there was this nice radiating response, a good six to ten millimeters around the osteoperforation site. And why this is important is because if you are doing a whole quadrant, maybe you only do one or two perforations uh, per, per site, whereas if you're using it uh, to um, release a stubborn movement and a challenging tooth, uh, to close a space or to resolve a rotation, maybe you do two or three per side and not just one or two um, you know, per site. Uh, because of this radiating effect, if you're doing a full quadrant for accelerating uh, tooth movement, then maybe you may have to, you could dial down the number of, of um, uh, perforations. They then looked at the pain um, reported by these patients with the experimental side as well as uh, compared to the side where it was the control. And there was really no difference uh, from one day to a week to two to, to four weeks. Um, and so what this schematic shows is that undergoing normal orthodontic um, tooth movement, we see that there's the normal uh, expression and presence of these inflammatory markers, but yet when you perforate uh, the, uh, around this, these teeth, you get an increase in osteoclastogenesis um, uh, due to this increase in inflammatory markers that are present. And when you have more osteoclastogenesis occurring, you've got more cells that are present around this tooth to resorb the bone and hence make the teeth move uh, faster and to help facilitate the, the movement. So the conclusions from the study is that there was a significant increase in the cytokine expression uh, that, that are known to recruit osteoclasts and known to differentiate 
those cells. There was an increase in canine retraction 2.3 fold compared to a control group. Patients reported very little or minimal discomfort um, and uh, it, it was shown to be effective, comfortable, and safe procedure to use to accelerate tooth movement under uh, for patients undergoing orthodontic uh, treatment and they claim there's a reduction in the treatment about about 62 percent um, and again this is November 2013 AJODO. So the conclusions from this very beautiful simple yet impactful scientific um, findings are that with osteoperforations you get an increase in inflammation, cytokine expression, increase in bone remodeling and the net impact, the net result is an increase in the rate of tooth movement. And so when it comes to osteoperforations, I use these uh, made by Propel, orthodontics technology. There is the single-use one where you've got to dial in. It's kind of like the one with your training wheels where you can dial in your depth. You've got a retractable sheath. Once you hit that depth, the red light goes on. You've got the, the next step up where you throw off your training wheels, uh, and you've got the removable tip, uh, which is very easy to spin because of the nice... Uh, diameter of, of the grip right here. Then you've got uh, the Cadillac right here, uh, the power driver, which you'll see, see a video momentarily, um, where it is great because it's a better patient experience. It's smoother. Um, there's uh, less, uh, it's just smooth. It's just better for everybody, less uh, um, fatigue of the doctor's uh, wrist uh, doing this, etc. So when it comes to the, the benefits of manual osteoperforations, you know, compared to the uh, approaches that I showed you, uh, it's minimally invasive. It can be done in minutes. I mean, it takes me, I schedule a one half hour, 30 minutes to do all four quadrants, and that includes getting numb. Um, and with the PT drivers, really just decrease this time. There is no recovery. There's no downtime. There's no stitches to remove. There's no swelling. Dear patient, we're you know we're going to be um, offering osteoperforations. I can I, I get you numb. I make small dimples or perforations uh, into uh, through the gum tissue into the bone between the roots of the teeth. There's no downtime. It's not surgery. There's no stitches. There's no swelling. You can go back to work uh, or about your day as if nothing ever happened. And that's my spiel. It takes me 43 seconds to say it. Uh, it's doctor controlled. Um, and again, we can uh, shave time off of treatment time, less visits to the office, et cetera. And I advertise. Boy, I advertise uh, you know, moving teeth without braces and in half the time uh, with uh, aligner therapy and, and propel orthodontics. And it has uh, attracted a wonderful uh, number of new patients over the last several years. Um, and uh, it's super easy. So if you're doing TADS, uh, this is a no-brainer. And you want to evaluate the treatment area, look at your radiographs, your clinical evaluation, have them rinse with chlorhexidine twice for about a minute. I personally use topical gel, uh, a compounded gel, and after two or three minutes, I, I wipe it off and then I go in and I give local anesthetic with a, a old-fashioned needle. So I want to make sure that they're prof uh, prof um, uh, you know, profoundly numb. Um, and if you have any questions about topical anesthetics, you can look at the 2015 uh, JCO article uh, where I wrote the coattails of some of these excellent other doctors here that you recognize uh, to be a part of it. So, um, and so this is uh, me doing uh, Propel real quickly on a patient here, but. Uh, this is um, where I get mine from. I, I gain nothing from this referral. I've got no vested interest in this pharmacy. But if you call up and ask for Steve, the pharmacist, tell him you're doing Propel. He is super familiar with uh, everything, and they walk you right through it. So this is what I use, the baddest topical in town. Um, and that's the procedure right there. That's the old one with the training wheel and the light. Uh, in the interest of time, I will continue here. But in my experience, most patients require, at this point in time, one treatment. Um, stubborn extraction uh, spaces may require a second one. Um, and so, as you will see with high-frequency vibration, um, I use uh, one MOPS, manual osteoperforation procedure, and high-frequency vibration. And um, that has been my, my staple now for the last uh, about 18 months, uh, and it's been wonderful. Um, so where do I perforate? Well, you know, truthfully, it's, it's wherever you need uh, to facilitate or accelerate the treatment. So if you have a palatally erupted cuspid, perforate all around that to get it tied to the arch wire 
uh, much more quickly. Uh, if you're trying to close spaces, I'll do one in the attached tissue and one uh, in the unattached tissue. Um, and so, uh, you know, and sometimes I, I go in uh, at a slight angle uh, just so I can um, not just go horizontal but get a little bit of a vertical almost a, a 45 degree angle so I try to uh, disrupt as much medullary bone as possible uh, when it comes to making these perforations and, and stimulate as much localized inflammation. So, uh, you know, we as orthodontists are so anal when it comes to, to specific numbers and the simple fact is in the anterior you do less you do a little bit more in the buckle in terms of depth and the only time I go past five is if I'm doing a lower um, uh, molar here uh, but you basically want to break through the cortical plate of bone into the medullary bone now understand this and this is very important that when you're doing manual osteoperforations this is not cutting okay it's not taking a burr and cutting uh, tissue out or, or, or cutting coring a hole Imagine taking a block of ice and taking a burr and sinking the burr into the ice. You will spit out, you will chew out ice and leave a nice, clean, cylindrical, hollow hole where the blood will coagulate in. And that takes a heck of a lot more time to, that's like piezo surgery, that takes a heck of a lot more time to recover from. Instead, imagine that block of ice taking a self-tapping uh, wood screw and screwing it into the block of ice and instead of chewing and removing ice you're going to be causing this splintering this cracking this radiating cracking effect from the self-tapping wood screw into a block of ice and that is exactly what med uh, what uh, osteoperforations are doing manual osteoperforations are doing through the cortical plate into the medullary bone you are displacing the medullary bone you're not coring it as you would with the burr. You are not removing tissue. You are displacing it, causing this cracking, radiating effect to elicit as much inflammation as possible. And so here is immediately post-treatment, and I show patients uh, these pictures, and they're like, oh, that's like nothing. And uh, I tell patients, look, people go to plastic surgeons all day long, every day of the week, and they get acid peels and laser peels, this sucked in, this injected, uh, sucked out, disinjected it, and they walk around like a burn victim under a big hat and dark sunglasses for two weeks. And that's socially acceptable. Uh, and so this ain't nothing when it comes to that. And so here's immediately after and 30 minutes after. This is my own patient. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what it looks like. Uh, and it's very important that you tell patients to only take Tylenol, because if you take a, a leave or any uh, aspirin or any other anti-inflammatory, you will negate the inflammatory response that you're trying to stimulate. Uh, so the benefits of, of MOPS, uh, I will show you. This is a case that came to me as a second opinion. They found my, my name on uh, the Invisalign doctor locator, uh, they went to the website and they saw this thing about Propel and they were curious to learn about it. And so I treat this patient, as you will see, this David patient, an adult, typical adult, unhappy with his teeth, doesn't want braces and wants it done faster. And, and so I'm done in seven and a half months, in this case, with one refinement uh, instead of, um, you know, easily a year or, or 14 months on a case like this. And of course he needs perio. And so my periodontist next door to me loves me to align these teeth to get the roots into the alveolar bone so the topography is better. So any grafting that he's going to do uh, is going to heal much easier. So in a case like this, where do I perforate? I did basically one perforation, um, mesial of the, of the five, right in here, right at wherever I could get him. Now the truth is, in areas like this where it's very crowded, I may just score the cortical plate of bone to, to uh, stimulate inflammatory response because you know as well as I do getting in between those roots is going to be very challenging so you got to use your clinical judgment and so on the bottom here I did you know one perforations probably right uh, in the fixed tissue right at the mucal gingival junction on the upper same thing mesial of the of the five all around here one perforation and uh, super easy stuff here uh, and here he is handing out aligners, and I did, uh, I believe, two perforations procedures this is before high-frequency vibration, um, and I get to basically five months at this point. From here to here in five months, 
you can appreciate how in my ClinCheck I did not dial in enough labial root torque. If you look at tooth number 26, it certainly needs to have a little bit extra labial root torque. And I did not have my sash attachment on tooth number 10 to rotate that lateral in. Um, and so in refinement, I put my sash attachment on. My pushing vector of force is coming from the mesial sweeping across the crown towards the distal, help rotate that distal in. And I am done in seven and a half months. That's awesome. This is making my practice stand out, advertising it, People coming in who don't want braces, half the U.S. population do not want to step into your practice if you're only doing braces, period. And so what you can see here is the difference from month five to seven and a half, how I was able to rotate that tooth in. You can appreciate the torque improvement on tooth number 26. Uh, and, and so uh, seven and a half months, and he went and uh, got his um, gingival grafting here. Uh, complete. And so what? What's the big fat deal? This is the question you have to ask. Well, here is my um, my my you know, breakdown here of profitability per visit. And this is the beauty of the ecosystem that is Invisalign and iTero scanning is that you do an exam records consult scan. And I'm down till about 35, 40 minutes. Um, I bond attachments the next visit. He wanted to do mops right away. I did mops uh, one more time. Fourth visit, I remove attachment scan for refinement. This now with the iTero, this appointment is down to about 12 to 15 minutes. The scanning now is down to about three minutes. Um, and it, it between I do photos, remove attachments, and scan. Sometimes I leave the attachments on. It all depends. Patient comes back in, bond attachments, give aligners, remove attachments, pressions for retainers. Visit seven, bond um, retainer give retainers 15 minutes. So here is what I was charging back then. Invisalign, 6,500. Mops, uh, 600. I'm now at 650. Here's my total fee of 7,100. My hard costs. Back then, my lab fee was reduced by about 34%. I'm still between 34 and 38% rebate. This is my cost for my lab fee, my cost for my two tips and retainers and miscellaneous costs, et cetera. Here's my hard cost to treat the case. So this is my true overhead to complete David in seven visits. So I subtract it from my fee. Here's my net. I divide that over seven visits. Here's my profitability per visit at $800. Now, if you take away the initial exam and the, the retainers visit and simply focus on the visits responsible for moving teeth, that's five visits, my profitability per visit jumps up to over $1,100. It has a comma in it. My profitability per visit has a comma in it, like my bar tab before I got married. And so this is the so what. This is the wow. This is how you set yourself apart from others in your area and do it now before it becomes commonplace in 10, 12, 15 years. Those that are the first adopters, and this isn't even early adoption, man. This has been around for six years now. Uh, and so that's what. Uh, and so when it comes to other examples of a profitability per visit, uh, you, you'll see, let's make the assumption. This is, this is pure, you know, uh, made up uh, assumptions here. But let's say you have an estimated treatment time of 18 months, and here's your fee of 5,500. You have fixed cost of 1,200, leaving you with a spread, a net, a profit of 4,300. Now let's divide that based on the number of appointments. If you see a patient 20 times, meaning every four weeks, like they did in the 80s, that's your profitability per visit of 215. If you see them uh, half the number of appointments, around 10 or 11 at eight week intervals, your profitability per visit jumps up to there. If you see them, you know, four less appointments, your profitability per visit jumps up to 615. So just four more times can affect a, a potential loss of profitability per case of about seven to $800. That's, that's you know, profound. So now let's take that and let's assume that 20% of your patients are past their, their finish dates. So if you have 200 active cases, that means that 20% of 200, you have 40 patients in your office, 40 active patients, 40 patients of your active patients are over the treatment time. So if that means that if you are seeing them an additional four times to complete their case, that translates into a decrease of profitability per patient about $750. Now, if you add that time or multiply that times 40, 40, if you're making $750 less profitability per patient times 40 patients a month, that equals roughly $31,000 
and monthly scheduling inefficiencies. Notice I didn't say you're not losing the money, but it is scheduling inefficiencies. These are people that are clogging up your schedule that should not be there to begin with. And so my very smart friend, Thomas Shipley, uh, had a beautiful article in, in orthodontic practice here uh, where you know he's seeing patients um, much less frequently and fewer appointments. And, and he uh, made the, the, the wonderful keen observation that for a nominal investment, uh, ramping up, if you will, of $6,000, you're gonna get a 48 pack of tips, MOPS tips, manual osteoperforation tips, that you can, if you only take one, each patient only takes one, maybe two perforation procedures. And I would think now we're down to uh, almost one across the board when you add high frequency vibration. But you can, for a $6,000 investment, you can affect 25 to 35 patients in your practice. That means you have 25 to 35 fewer people clogging your schedule each month. That means roughly six to nine fewer visits every week. That means every day you could have 30 to 45 minutes of free chair time to see new patients, to, to update your Facebook status, to, to shoot, take some time off for goodness sakes, to have a lifestyle adjustment. I mean, do whatever it is that, that suits you best. So what does this mean? That there is an almost immediate return on investment for your nominal uh, investment of $6,000. You can affect, again, 25 to 35 patients rather than spending $6,000 for six devices for, for other um, modalities out there that are low frequency vibrations that, that would only affect six patients. I mean, that doesn't make any business sense whatsoever. Uh, and so here we are with the Accelerator PT video. So I will um, have you listen into this here. One second, please. Hello, my name is Dr. Jonathan Nikosesis, and I will be showing you how to perform micro osteoperforations using the Accelerator PT or Power Tip. Evaluate the treatment area on the patient. Track the roots, the mandibular nerve, and maxillary sinuses. Have patient rinse twice with chlorhexidine for the duration of one minute each. Anesthetize and propel with the accelerator PT. To ensure the patient's comfort, anesthetize the treatment area using either a topical or local infiltrative anesthetic. Once you have assured that the treatment area is anesthetized, secure the PT tip into the contraangle. To assemble the Arthonia driver, please reference the manufacturer's manual. Before inserting the accelerator PT, ensure the driver has been fully charged. Then open and rotate the latch on the back of the contraangle about 30 degrees and insert the blue side of the PT first into the contraangle head. Rotate the tip until you feel it seat and close the latch. To ensure the tip is fully seated, observe the back of the contra angle. If the tip is correctly attached, it should look fully flush. Micro osteoperforation depths are determined by bone and soft tissue thickness. Micro osteoperforations should penetrate through the cortical plate into cancellous bone. Once the PT tip is secured in the contra angle, turn the driver on by pressing the power button. The next step is to select the torque using the torque button on the driver. The ideal torque setting for micro osteoperforations is 30 Newton. Next, use the RPM button to select the speed of the driver. 
the recommended speed setting for the microosteoperforations is high. The higher speed and torque settings for this orthonia driver are uniquely ideal for microosteoperforation. As the final step before beginning microosteoperforation, ensure the reverse indicator is off. The power driver has two modes, temporary and general mode. You can use either mode for microosteoperforation. In the temporary mode, you can hold down the start-stop button and the power driver will continue the rotation until the button is released. In the general mode, you must press the start-stop button briefly to start the rotation and then press it again to stop the rotation. To begin microosteoperforation, place the driver so the tip is perpendicular to the treatment area with the driver display facing you. Press the start-stop button to start the rotation and apply gentle pressure to engage the tip into the attached gingiva. Press the start-stop button again to stop the rotation. With experience, you can easily and intuitively know when you have reached the desired perforation depth by recognizing subtle changes in the driver, such as hearing the motor change cadence and feeling the speed increase once you have perforated the cortical plate. To remove the PT tip, change the direction by pressing the counterclockwise button until the reverse indicator light comes on. Then start the rotation until the PT tip disengages from the attached gingiva. At the completion of the treatment, remove the single-use power tip and dispose of it appropriately. Be sure to power off and charge the driver for your next use. Where possible, perform two to three microosteoperforations on attached gingiva in a linear fashion or triangular fashion. Perforations can be made between the roots in both the attached and unattached gingival mucosa. You may repeat microosteoperforations with Propel every 10 to 12 weeks until the desired movement is achieved. Be sure to provide patients with aftercare instructions ensuring that they avoid any non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. <laughs> Tylenol is the only recommended medication should any discomfort occur. <clears throat> so that's a nice instructional video. There are others, uh, but let's get some right to some cases here. Uh, we've got about uh, 26 minutes left. Um, and so here's a case where uh, we have uh, just under a year, uh, two osteoperforations, and this young lady was getting married. I treated her with uh, Propel now and Invisalign. I did no mops on the other side here, uh, and uh, only manual osteoperforations on the upper and lower anterior and on the uh, upper and lower right side. And my class two correction is such where, and you can see the differential diagnosis here, is she's skeletally asymmetric and the body's natural reaction um, is to uh, compensate by the super eruption on this side. So oftentimes for my patients that are mildly asymmetric, I see the body's uh, compensatory reaction is to super erupt um, the opposing dentition to maintain contact. And so uh, here I do some intrusion uh, on uh, this case. There's no distalization here and there's a bite jump at the end. Uh, and what we see here is in uh, seven months which are my first refinement in 22 stages, I went from a 90% class two uh, to about a 10% class two, uh, simply uh, by uh, intruding these teeth. So I intruded the five, six, and seven. I ended up with um, a posterior open bite in my ClinCheck, and you can see the difference in the gingival margin. If you follow the gingival margin, you can see how it's much more even as I intruded those teeth. So manual osteoperforations, uh, allowed me to help facilitate the intrusion here, as well as my elastic pull. Uh, and so uh, this um, this is a a, a real uh, time saver. And, and at the same time, you can see I've got a nice uh, confluent um, smile line here with the curvature of the lower lip. And we are done right before her wedding uh, in about 11 and a half months. Uh, and my mistake I made here is I did not distal rotate 
uh, the upper six and seven around the mesolingual cusp to get that last little bit of correction. Uh, but you can see, you know, I'm here to show my learning process as well. But you can see the nice, uh, better gingival uh, display here, uh, et cetera. So uh, this patient, a subdivision class three on the right, I did uh, mops twice on him, and I'm done in just over five months, came to me from the doctor locator. And so think about this. What is the offending quadrant of, of this uh, patient? And it's the lower right side. My midline is upper midline is coincident with Cupid's bow. Uh, my lower midline is the one that's off. So when it comes to manual osteoperations, I'm doing nothing on the right side. I'm doing it in the upper and lower anterior, uh, maybe a two per site here. I am doing nothing on the upper right. Instead, I'm really focusing on the lower right quadrant where I'm doing uh, perforations, one in the mucogingival, the fixed tissue, one in the unattached or right at the mucogingival junction, and that allows me to get better elastic reaction. Let me rephrase that. It allows me to get better reaction for my elastic pull uh, on my class three just on the right side. And I am done with Alan here in five months. That is profound. Again, found me on the doctor locator, went to my website, learned about Propel, and it's like shooting fish in a barrel. So this here is a, a true practice differentiator from a super class one on the right to a solid class one. And he is about four years in retention now and looks exactly the same, just came in for a new retainer. Um, and so, so what, again, like the other case, the difference with this patient and the next, and the previous one I showed you, it's the same fee uh, same overhead, same everything, but the difference is one less visit. The, uh, David, the previous patient, was seven visits. Alan is six visits. So same hard cost, same discount, same everything, but six visits instead of seven, and my profitability jumps up to 931. Uh, when you get rid of the initial exam and the retainer visits and focus on the visits only responsible for moving teeth, now my profitability per visit is just shy of $1,400. Uh, next patient, we have um, nine, point, uh, nine and a half months of progress here. This is uh, in a four by cuspid extraction case. Uh, not, it's like one of my first four by cases. Please don't take this as an example of where I am today. Uh, but you will see lots of crowding. And in this case, the beauty of case like this is you can target where you want to facilitate tooth movement. So in this patient, I did two perforations from cuspid to cuspid, leaving the posterior teeth alone. So the beauty of manual osteoperation is that you can target exactly where you want to uh, do uh, to facilitate the movement. Um, and switching out weekly, and looking back at my ClinCheck now, boy, I design it so differently. Um, but we get to nine and a half months and, and 38 stages, nine and a half months. Mind you, this is with PVS and with the old plastic. This is not smart track. So this is when the struggle was real, my friends. And so back then, you know, to get to here in nine and a half months, my bite is deepened. I mean, there's all sorts of awfulness going on here. I know that my, my teeth are divergent on the bottom, which you see from the pan. The top is not that bad. Uh, but you know, in today's technology with ClinCheck Pro and G6 uh, and uh, the new plastic and scanning, my results would be uh, far improved. And so this is a long treatment plan. I'm not going to lie to you. This is before high frequency vibration. My overbite is terribly deepened. I mean, this is my first stab at four bicuspid extraction. Um, and so, you know, I'm here to show the good and, and what could be better types of cases as well because we're all here to learn and to make ourselves better. Uh, but, you know, for refinements uh, with uh, uh, some mops uh, and here, uh, next case, 16 and a half months of treatment, class three anterior open bite. I did two mops at uh, uh, month um, four and a half and month seven to get me to refinement at 11 months. And here, for Matthew, I am uh, perforating him basically from six to six. I did one uh, perforation uh, at each interproximal from six to six in the attached tissue, going uh, at a slightly oblique angle where possible to get as much um, vertical uh, disruption as well. And so here with my Meow appliance, my Meow mechanics, I'm entering the posterior teeth. 
The anterior teeth I am moving out, I create space. After space creation, I then extrude with simultaneous retraction. Notice here how I put on all the attachments from the beginning. I keep them to the end. I add class three elastics a few stages in. And this is the beauty of plastic and osteoperforations is that you can set it and forget it and just hand out aligners. And this is the beauty of integrating this in seamlessly into your office systems. And so at stage um, 18 weeks in, I did, uh, again, this is PVS and the old material, the old hard plastic EX30 material. And what you see here is I started my, uh, my mops at stage nine after 18 weeks, class three elastics, and I get to here in 27 stages in 11 months. That's profound. I can't do that with braces. No tads were used here. I did IPR prior to my impression. Um, and again, he's skeletally asymmetric. And after 16 months, uh, I threw on some vertical elastics here. In hindsight, I would have separated. I would have put separators around this five to free up the contact, then remove the separators, and boom, it would have slammed shut. But in a month and a half, that's as far uh, as we could get. And this young man is so stable. He is about three and a half years in stability. I'm going to show you one year of stability. Uh, and it is absolutely fantastic. Next case, treated in five months, coming in before her wedding. Um, and I get this minor stuff done in about five months. Again, old plastic here. We're not talking you know, the new plastic. Uh, old plastic. And I basically did one perforations mesial of four to four. Uh, top and bottom, and I get her through her aligners in, uh, here we are, 12 weeks, but I get her through everything in uh, 20 uh, weeks with one refinement and broaden that as much as I possibly could. Uh, next patient, seven and a half months, I did three mops. This is early on because I was worried about the expansion here. This patient needs a Sarpy, but she doesn't want it. So what am I going to do, turn her away? Or am I going, and she was actually just in two days ago uh, getting her permanent retainer fixed, and, she, um, and she's probably about f uh, three years in retention, looks exactly the same. Uh, and she sent her sister to me, and I just started her sister with Invisalign and uh, mops and um, high-frequency vibration. Uh, but look at this, how much you can expand with plastic. And my mistake I made here, folks, and don't follow this example, is I did not apply labial root torque to the upper four, fives, and sixes. And here I am at refinement, and you can see the buckle tipping. In hindsight, I should have been applying labial root torque, but I can't get this with braces, especially un in this amount of time, especially with unraveling eight and nine. And look at that arch development, and seven and a half months of total treatment time, and here we are, a year in retention. I just saw her uh, two days ago, and she is in, not two days ago, today's Tuesday. Saw her yesterday, my goodness. Um, and she looks exactly the same, about at least three years in retention. Uh, here, next patient, 10 months, getting these stubborn laterals to come down properly. I perforated two uh, perforations on either side, just around these laterals. So I did not go all the way back to the sixes. And when you have a, a, a clin check that doesn't work well, uh, I'm sorry, it's not designed well, it's hard for teeth to track. So I extruded improperly here on this case. Um, and so, but where I did the, the refinement, I got it back on tracking. And with high frequency vibration, maybe that would attract better uh, in today's world. But I'm done in 10 months here. Again, perforated twice on the mesial and distal around, uh, two spots on mesial and distal around the laterals. Um, Nice improvement there. Another adult, this is a hygienist. I treat all my hygienists in my area for about $2,200 for Invisalign and Propel. Look at this five here. Look at that rotation. I did uh, one MOPS procedure, and I got that rotation out, got to refinement in five months. That's insane. She's missing a bicuspid. That's why she's asymmetric. But I can't do that. I mean, that's plastic alone. That's fantastic. We have another patient here, four mops a year, posterior crossbite, no crossbite elastics used here. I'm doing osteoperforations, uh, one perforation now. Now this is with scanning and smart track plastic. And I did one perforation here from the six 
all the way around to the other six. Oh, and by the way, I've got a five that's completely rotated around here, 90 degrees. And so I ended my aligner on the four uh, window on the lingual so I can bond the button, spin that tooth around. And in five months, I got that, res that uh, rotation resolved. And me, uh, I, had, I was teaching that day. I had six doctors shadowing me that day. And I thought I'd do this patient a favor and remove this so that she could come back four weeks later. And I would do my refinement scan at that point. And I was so sure and confident that the sixes and the sevens would slam forward to prevent that rotation of the five. And I was totally thick-headed, totally disregarding and disrespecting the classic studies of Edwards from the 50s and the circumferential fibers and, and the amalgam tattoos and circumferential fibers and fiberotomies that, uh, that Dr. Edwards did. Uh, and lo and behold, in four short weeks, look at that. Totally my fault. Totally ha egg on my face. But my crossbite's corrected. And unlike uh, that young lady you saw before where I did not apply labial root torque, in this patient who's 20 years older than that young lady, I got nice labial root torque because I dialed it into my ClinCheck. So at this point, my midline is off, so I'm going to throw on class 2 elastics and class 2 elastics in refinement, and I am done with this patient in 12 months. In today's world, I would have done one MOPS and given her high-frequency vibration. You're going to see some cases shortly. And she is about two and a half years in retention, and the crossbite stable, the tooth that's giving me a hassle is that rotated five. I should have put a labial bonded retainer on that case. Here's some quick cases here. 11 months um, uh, with three uh, perforation procedures um, from one side to the other. We have one perforation procedure, compliments of Dr. Shipley. Uh, we've got one perforation procedure here, six months no refinement, compliments of Dr. McGill. Uh, but here's an example of some perforations from Dr. Shipley uh, and eight weeks uh, using um, uh, one perforation procedure and aligners. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, another one from Dr. Shipley, uh, one perforation procedure, and you get these teeth aligned uh, super well uh, and easily. We've got a Maryland bridge here that is removed, and he finishes this case in 51 uh, days with one perforation procedure to close that space. And here's the uh, post-treatment uh, panoramic. Uh, awesome, amazing stuff. Same doctor, same clinical situation, different patient, remove the Maryland Bridge, and five months, look at that root parallelism uh, he has there. Awesome stuff. Another case from Dr. Shipley, four and a half months, manual perforations one time to help align that crowding. Uh, again, some rotations here as well, um, and uh, done in six months time with one perforation procedure anterior crossbite corrected in four months with one perforation procedure. Um, when it comes to braces, I still use them once upon a time uh, here and there. Uh, this is my first insignia case where I was attempting to do Damon braces, uh, and I'm by no means a Damonite, uh, but I he's class two, his chief concern, uh, the teeth stick out, so I extracted uh, the upper fours, lower right four, and lower left five to protract here. And so after five months of leveling aligning is when I uh, anesthetize them, put TADS in, and attempted to do some sliding mechanics. And I'm trying to slide everything forward. Um, and you'll see here, I get the 12 months. So for, uh, for seven months, month five to 12, I did three perforation procedures, and I got this amount closed. And I told James, and here we are, I saw him every month, I did three MOPS procedures, but what you can see here is the amount of space I closed in that amount of time. That's pretty amazing. Likewise, on the bottom, you can see how I closed this amount of space pretty uh, quickly. Now, the problem was at month 13 and 14, I tried to close this space, and it stopped. And at month 14 and 15, I went back in. Uh, I'm sorry, month 16, I went back in, and I did uh, two more MOPS procedures. Uh, to help close the space to, to release this challenging movement. And two months later, I was able to close that space and get completely done. And here's the time of removal uh, and um, uh, just showing some before and after. Again, I don't do braces all that often anymore, uh, but this is just a historical case. And he's class two skeletal. That's why he ends, on, uh, ends up end on in the buckle. Uh, but broaden those the buckle corridors, uh, reduce the protrusion of the, those upper teeth. He does have short lips. I understand that, but at least they are competent now at rest. And the E-line is uh, uh, certainly more pleasing. Now, when it comes to high-frequency vibration, 
this is uh, the device that I use. Uh, you, you use it for five minutes a day, only five minutes. That is huge when it comes to patient compliance. Patients, you know, their 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 um, ability to pay attention to do something for any more than five minutes really becomes challenging, and I think it has a huge impact on compliance. So five minutes goes by like that, um, and you can read through this in terms of all the different features, but there is software uh, that you can track it if you show de so desire. But here's some uh, research uh, showing high-frequency vibration and its effect on the extraction of a um, the bone, um, the healing, I should say, of a tooth movement extraction, uh, the tooth extraction socket, and high-frequency vibration preserves alveolar bone and it actually increases the intermembranous ossification in these extraction sites. So uh, this is uh, these are from the Journal of Dental Research. These are all available in the public space, and this is high-frequency vibration above 120 hertz. Uh, this shows the osteogenic effect of high-frequency vibration accelerating uh, alveolar bone um, and uh, nearly twice the amount of uh, bone remodeling as compared to low-frequency vibration. And again, this is five minutes a day, very easily tolerated by your patients. Uh, and you can see that there's an increase in bone remodeling activity which resulted in thicker and denser bone trabeculae as compared to low-frequency vibration. When it comes to bone volume, High frequency, hands down, has a much better impact when compared to low frequency vibration when it comes to uh, a trabecular bony volume and thickness. Um, when it comes to actual tooth movement, uh, high frequency vibration has been shown to actually uh, stimulate the same inflammatory response, these same secondary messengers that we talked about earlier on as compared to the experimental side. Um, and so uh, when it comes to discomfort, uh, I will tell you my anecdotally, and now you can see in this research, that high frequency vibration indeed decreases discomfort uh, for my patients. So here we have a patient, uh, class two, large overjet, uh, high angle, TMJ uh, issues, popping and clicking, uh, et cetera, high mandibular plane angle. Uh, and so what do you do here, surgery? Well, I'm gonna channel my my uh, meow mechanics, and you're gonna see, I treat this patient with, with high frequency vibration only, five minutes a day, switching out weekly, and uh, no mops here. And what you're gonna see is, look at this amount of, uh, of intrusion that I am doing on these posterior teeth. Weekly switches alone will not allow these aligners to fit as well as they do. But you can see my progressively increasing intrusion of the posterior teeth. I'm intruding the, the fours a millimeter, the fives uh, more than the fours, the sixes more than the fives, and sevens more than the sixes. I do a bite jump at the end to look at the amount of uh, basically class two correction. She's wearing class two elastics here, and I'm intruding those posterior teeth and switching out aligners. Nowadays, I see patients like this every four or five months, but because it's something new to me, I wanted to see her you know, much more frequently, uh, and she was, is the, the niece of one of my uh, staff members. But here we are at five-month progress. Now, truth be told, she has about a one-and-a-half millimeter CRCO slip, but at this point, I did IPR here on the lower, and I backed those up in refinement and intruded them to get the um, interference out there, and her TMJ symptoms, the popping and clip, kick, clicking, is improving throughout treatment. And I am done with her case in eight months. No TMJ symptoms. No, she felt virtually nothing when she switched her aligners out thanks to the high-frequency vibration. Truly impactful stuff. This is my staff member getting these stubborn rotations uh, done on those upper laterals. And I'm done in four, four and a half months here. That's awesome. Uh, this patient, chipping, anterior teeth, all, we're not fixing the posterior crossbite. All we are doing is using class three elastics and getting those teeth out of trauma. So for the first four months, he did normal Invisalign. Then I added in high frequency vibration for the last five months, and he noticed immediately, and he's a, uh, a psychotherapist, uh, a, um, a motivational speaker, and he noticed immediately a decrease in pain and discomfort and we get him done in 12 months. We've got my uh, positive over by overjet, and that was the goal of his treatment. Next patient, I treated with MOPS. This patient, 60-something years old, 
I'm intruding eight and nine. I'm doing mops now, basically distal of the cuspid to distal of the cuspid, but on the lower left, I am doing it back to the six because he's skeletally asymmetric. I'm doing one mops, NV Pro 5, and you can see on a 67-year-old the amount of intrusion and the, how good of a fit I am getting. Look, that's insane in terms of tracking. And at refinement here, 23 stages in six months of treatment, that's phenomenal. And we get to seven and a half months, and at this point, I've got positive overbite overjet, and he is sent to the prostodontist down the hall to restore those teeth. And now I'm, I'm tweaking uh, the lower cusp and the lower anterior tooth here uh, to eliminate some minor uh, heavy interferences here. Uh, but that's insane. Seven and a half months to intrude those teeth, one mop, high frequency vibration. This is the new standard for me in 2017. Next patient, one mops, V Pro 5 to alleviate this crowding. I apologize for the records, but I'm done in, high, in, in five and a half months. I saw the patient maybe three times. Profitability per visit has a comma in it. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, also, please uh, visit uh, this website. You can um, uh, get whatever CE credits that you have coming your way. Um, and um, that's it. So we got a couple questions here, which I will go through. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Julio. Um, can we see the biological information, for example, bone compaction, bone recover? Uh, I would suggest that you reach out to whatever vendor you would like to, and they have those studies when it comes to CT scans. Um, I know uh, my good friend, Dr. Thomas Shipley, has uh, some progressive CT scans that are in some of his publications uh, that show, indeed, the recovery uh, of the bone. Um, uh, Jamie, how frequently do I uh, change the aligners? Boy, that's a loaded question. Um, ultimately, my prescription for changing aligners is very dependent on the age of the patient, teenager versus adult, uh, the type of periodontium, thick, fibrous versus thin, and also the type of movement that we're doing. So if I'm doing very simple first order movements, with minimal second orders, you know, uh, movement of the apices, I will go down to like four or five days. If, however, it's an extraction case um, and there's a hell of a lot of rotation and it's just, and it's an older patient, I will do MOPS, high frequency vibration. I will start out at a week switches. When I get later on into treatment and as certain things are completed, I will, you know, major movements are completed, I will then accelerate it uh, down to maybe five days or even, um, you know, in refinement. You know, in refinement, my, I would say 85, 90% of my movement is done. So I will do uh, easily, you know, uh, three to four or five days. But ultimately, depends on your gut instinct, the age of the patient, the type of movement, the quality of movement you're trying to do. And, and you just have to look at your clinical judgment uh, for that. Um, can you have a copy of this presentation? I believe it will be archived on this website that you see behind you. Um, boy, you guys are asking lots of questions, which is absolutely fantastic. The last one I did, it was crickets, so this is a welcome change. Um, uh, but, 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 uh, how do I coordinate? George, how do I coordinate VPRO5 and MOP? So I deliver aligners uh, and uh, bond attachments deliver aligners. Um, I schedule a half hour, it really takes about 15 minutes. My bonding attachments, upper and lower arches, I am done. I put on all my own attachments in the state of New Jersey. I will bond uh, top and bottom attachments, uh, and I'm done in five minutes with trimming up. Um, and then my staff goes over. I treat a lot of adults, a lot of older adults, and oftentimes they need that full half hour just to get used to taking them on and off. So when I coordinate it, I will give vpro 5 that first day. That patient will come back. Uh, two, three, four weeks later, and that's when I do the mops uh, because I uh, routinely do that just so that they get used to wearing their aligners. I don't want to, you know, bond attachments, deliver aligners, and do mops all in the same visit. I've done it, and I do do it when they, and I give them the option 
but most people uh, wait to do it for two or three weeks later. Um, but I will do mops, and I'll do it once, and it, I schedule a half hour. Uh, it is super quick and easy. Um, when, in terms of follow-up, uh, Jamie, uh, do you change more frequently with mops or V-Profi with the same treatment plan? Um, if I am doing um, one alone, I will probably stay at a week. If I'm doing together, I will drop down to four or five days. But again, it's a judgment call. It all depends on the type of movement that you're doing. Um, when I'm doing mops only for uh, a few challenging movements, how frequently do you change the aligners? Well, presuming it's a challenging movement, that makes the presumption that stuff ain't tracking well. And so I would simply keep it at a week until I get uh, the teeth back on track. Um, what percentage of your patients spread their payments beyond the finish? The majority. And so that's a very valid concern about being paid after you are done. And I used to think like that and, and have that same concern and is very valid. But honestly, I can count the time, the number of times on one hand and not even use all five fingers over the last 10 years. Not that I've been doing Propel that long, but, but where I've been stiffed. And so uh, it has simply not been an issue. So when it comes to the end, and I say, oh, we're done with your treatment, uh, would your balance is, I'm making up a number here, $2,300. Are you able to pay that off up front? Like anything in life, uh, uh, Trent, you don't get what you don't ask for. And so if they say, yeah, I can pay it off, then that's great. If they say, no, I can't, uh, then you say, uh, my staff will say, uh, well, can you pay it off in maybe three or four months instead of, you know, 10? And if they say great, then that's often awesome. If they say no, well, just continue going. And and the beauty of it is, Trent, you're getting a monthly annuity without seeing anybody in your schedule. And people, and I'm still seeing them for a retainer check, so it's not like they're you know gone from the practice. So it has simply not been an issue. Uh, I mentioned that I charge 650 per fell. Uh, so what I do now, back when I charged 600 for a propel. 650 that's when I was doing two maybe three mops now what I do is I still charge 650 my V Pro 5 uh, that I um, uh, buy in bulk I, I think it's down around three hundred dollars my tip when I buy in bulk it's down around a hundred and ten hundred and twenty dollars so at four hundred and twenty dollars overhead my uh, my spread is uh, two hundred and um, and thirty dollars and so for a $230 profit, where can you get an ROI of, you know, roughly 60% on your money? So from a business point of view, from, from compared to other modalities of treatment out there, you know, I have personally found, my experience is the threshold, the magic threshold for me in terms of patient acceptance was $700. When I was at $700 or above, mentally patients think it's closer to a thousand and I had much less um, acceptance. When I dropped it down to six or 650, mentally they're closer to 500 and for them it's like pissing in the ocean and it's like no big deal. Uh, and so at the 650 I think is the magic number. And so with all these other modalities, you know, that, you know, started out well above a thousand and dropped down, you know, I just think you know, for me, it doesn't make sense to buy something to, to, to keep a bunch of inventory on a bunch of devices only hoping to break even. Uh, for me, it makes sense to, to spend $6,000 and get a bunch of devices that you can, you know, ra have a radiating effect in terms of ROI on the number of patients that you can treat. That's business sense to me. Uh, my retention protocol, um, I uh, uh, have patients where they're, a clear liner, a clear Essex retainer. I have an in-house lab technician. has been with the practice for probably 35 years, and um, uh, why we make everything in-house. Uh, we uh, have her wear, have patients wear uh, full time for eight month, eight weeks rather, 12 weeks depending on uh, the pain in the ass factor of the patient, depending on the the, the, the type of case uh, in the movement that we did. After that, I'll go to like a month or two of evening and bedtime, like 10 hours a day, and then eventually just bedtime. And then I'll follow people for a good, uh, well, in kids, I follow everybody until a decision is made about the wisdom teeth. Uh, that's just the way we do it. I gain a lot of um, replacement retainer fees during that time. For adults, I'll probably see them, 
you know, maybe two years, and I'll simply say just give us a call as needed. Um, so that's it. But thank you very much for your kind attention and your, your awesome questions. Uh, much more interactive than previous webinars, so you guys are to be congratulated. Um, and uh, I hope you found this informative. Um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know or let any uh, vendor know. Uh, and um, this, uh, this is it. This is the conclusion to the webinar. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye-bye.